will resonate and be spoken about for years to come. And with technology as it is today, it will not only impact black America, but this is a debate, a conversation, an event that I believe will have ramifications throughout the African community around the world. The event, of course, is called, Is Christianity the White Man's Religion? This is a myth that has floated around African American and African communities and other communities of color for hundreds of years. And that's why the subtitle of this debate is Debated, Answered, and Settled Once and For All. So you are definitely in the place to be today. I want to thank the distinguished pastor, Eric Mason, for allowing us to hold this event at his wonderful church, Epiphany Fellowship. I want to thank the members of Epiphany for all of their great volunteer work, most notably Katrina Williams, who helped put this together. I want to thank all of the members of the King Movement, all of the pastors, all of the Christians who have come from far and wide to support this event. I also want to thank members of the African Village who have come out today. I want to thank members of the Shrine of Mayotte who have come out today. If we have I know we're supposed to have, if any of the brothers and sisters from the Hebrew Israelite community, any Muslim brothers and sisters, or any other members of the quote unquote conscious community who have come out today, we thank you for coming out. We know that many of you started in the church, and for whatever reason, many of them legitimate you became discouraged with the church and with Christianity. And so we thank you for coming back into the church. And I do believe I can say this on behalf of Pastor Eric Mason, welcome home, if only for a day. <laughs> we love you. We're excited to have you here, and we are excited to be in your presence today. So thank you for coming. I am Chris Broussard. I'm the founder and president of the King Movement, which worked with Epiphany Fellowship to put this event together. King is an acronym that stands for Knowledge, Inspiration, and Nurture Through God. And King is a national Christian men's movement that is built to strengthen and empower men to become all that God's created us to be. Husbands, fathers, leaders, citizens, and role models. Because we know if we do just that, just that, that we will strengthen our families, our communities, black America, and America as a whole. So without further ado, let me introduce today's moderator. I mentioned him before. He's an absolute champion of the faith. He's the author of four books, most notably Woke Church, which I would encourage you to go out and get if you haven't already uh, bought it. It's a great read. You won't be disappointed. He is the pastor here at Epiphany Fellowship. And without further ado, welcome Dr. Eric Mason. Good afternoon, everybody. Y'all can do better than that. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And we are so glad um, that everyone was able to make it and be here. We are officially sold out. So there are no more tickets for today. So if you got any friends text messaging you, um, there's only space for the overflow in the basement where um, we'll have, um, uh, it, it'll be a very, very nice environment as well, but it's video streamed there directly. And so that's what's happening on that end. A lot of people have been asking us, is this streamed? No, it's not streamed. But we will be um, putting this on YouTube right after this on King's page and Epiphany Fellowship's page so that people can watch this on repeat across the world. So many people from across the world, we've got responses from Africa, um, England, UK, 
all over the world for people wanting to know whether or not this is streamed. And so we want you to know that this will be put out here at that time. So I want to first welcome to the stage um, a brother that is not, of course, a, uh, a stranger uh, to the conscious community and to many African Americans in the world who has been putting in a lot of work communicating uh, his philosophy uh, in the world. His name is Brother Jabari uh, Osaze. Uh, and uh, he has studied ancient Africa for over 30 years, uh, focusing primarily on uh, ancient comedic Egyptian history and spirituality. I only say Egyptian because that, you know, comedic tradition is what they want us to make sure we emphasize as a name. Brother Osaze has uh, led annual study tours to Egypt since 2002, in particular in, uh, with the uh, African Genesis Institute. Uh, more than 3,000 people seeking to uncover the wisdom and accomplishments of ancient Africans uh, have taken these epic journeys. Uh, he has also led monthly tours of the world-renowned Egyptian collections of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in Brooklyn, uh, New York, the, at the Brooklyn Museum, the University of Pennsylvania Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology, and the Oriental Institute of the University of Chicago and the Museum of Fine Arts. Brother Osaze has obtained a Bachelor of Science degree in Human Services and Africana Studies from Cornell University and uh, and his Master's of Science degree uh, from the Metropolitan College of New York in 1998. And he was initiated into the Kemetic Order, the Shan of Ta, uh, um, Ta uh, if I'm saying it right, Ta? Pata. Amen. Thank you for that, Pata. By Chief Priest Haru Ankh Ra Samach. All right, we want to acknowledge you, brother. If you stand so we can acknowledge you, brother. We want to acknowledge you. And he is also the author of Seven Little White Lies, The Conspiracy to Destroy the Self-Image. Let's give him, no matter what side of the fence you're on, let us give us a unifying uh, 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 admiration for him coming here and being with us today, Brother Osaze. Absolutely, 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 absolutely. Next we have another brother that's, uh, of course, not a stranger um, to us here either. Uh, we have our brother here, Brother Mohair Bantu. Dr. Mohair Bantu is here with us today. And uh, he goes by several titles, but of course that's one of his main titles. And um, he is also here from, uh, he's assistant professor at the, uh, of church history in black church studies at Fuller in Houston, Texas. Uh, he is also a holds an MA and PhD in Semitic and Egyptian languages from Catholic University of America and NDIB from Gordon-Conwell, that's my doctoral alma mater, uh, from CUME, the same actual campus I went to, and also a THM from Princeton Theological Seminary and a BA in theology from Wheaton. Uh, he, his primary disciplines include early Christianity in Africa and in Asia, urban ministry, and African-American theology. He has two forthcoming books, uh, one called A Multitude of All Peoples, Engaging Ancient Christianity, global, uh, Christianity's Global Identity, and that will be come through InterVarsity Press. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and his last book is also a gospel, now, make sure that I know how to say this correctly, Hymenote, Hymenote, a, a, a Constructive Theology and Critical Reflection of Africa, uh, of, uh, on African and diasporatic Christianity. So let's give our brother here, uh, uh, Mohair Bantu, a big round of applause. <laughs> Although I'm, I'm Christian, I'm impartial here. I'm just the moderator. Somebody say moderator. moderator. 
And so as a moderator, my job is to just facilitate both points of views and their ability to communicate their point of views. Um, in order to keep our time very, very concise, my brothers, there will be a timer up there for each one of you. Those clocks will drop down. The first clock is the 20-minute clock, which is your presentation time. The 10-minute clock is um, the, the rebuttal time for each one of you. And so this is the way it's going to go through each section as we uh, work through each one of these sections. The first one is going to be, is Christianity the white man's religion? Under that section, um, we will have 20 minutes for that. Um, uh, Brother Jabari is going to present for uh, his 20 minutes. And then after that, um, Dr. Bantu is going to do his 20 minutes. Then after that, uh, Brother Jabari is going to do the 10-minute response to that. Then there will be another 10-minute response to uh, Brother Jabari's presentation by Dr. Bantu. And then in between each one, we'll have five-minute breaks. Somebody say breaks. There we go. So, without any further ado, um, we are going to go ahead and get this started. And that starts now with Brother Jabari. First, I have to go off and say that wherever Dr. Mason got his black medallion, he took me back. <laughs> Do you see what he's wearing around his neck? I had one of those in the, in the um, late 80s, early 90s. You, don't, you can't find those anymore. That's, that's, a, that's a brother from us. So I, I want to just thank him for being so gracious and allowing us to be here to have an important conversation. I must say thank you to our dear brother, Chris Broussard. Where is brother Chris? There you go. We have to say thank you for all of his work putting this together. I must have been on the phone with him about six hours this week, so I, I know that he spent a lot of time making sure this event came together, and I want to Absolutely. give him honor Absolutely. for that. Absolutely. And before I speak, I would usually ask for an elder to give me permission to speak, and I am absolutely honored to have my elder, the person that I have studied for over 20 years with, Babaheru Ankara Samad Sepata. May I speak? Dwa, dwa, dwa. So, we have very little time, so I'm going to move very quickly. Let me just first start by saying that I have no enmity whatsoever for people who are in the Abrahamic traditions. I have no problem with our people who are Christians. Hebrews or Jews and Muslims. I am here because you are my family. There may be things that we disagree on, important topics that we must address, but I am here because I see you and I hope you see me. I am you and you are me. So sometimes when we have debates, sometimes we get into these, these moods where we're almost gang-banging in the conscious community. Gang banging in the church, gang banging in the comedic temple. We're not going to do that today. I spent so much time. So much time researching my, my, my dear brother, Dr. Bantu, and, and research. And I keep telling Dr. Mason, you know, I think I got to get in with you, right? I'm going to get it in with you, right? But the reality is, I say that. Um, with humor and in love, because as I research these brothers, as I research Chris Broussard, these are moral, good brothers. These are not people that I cannot work with because I carry an ankh. Mm -hmm. My family is Christian. My mother, my father, my sisters. And so I want to begin by saying that you are, I am you and you are me. Now, having said that, let me say that I'm also a priest, a high priest, in fact, of Ma'at. And that does mean that I am obligated to tell you the truth. Now, sometimes when I tell the truth, people get bruised. I want to say at the offset, that is not my intention to harm anyone. And if I tell the truth and you are bruised, the only thing that I will ask is that you reevaluate your connection to the truth. That is what I intend to bring here to you today. So let's go. First of all, let's just recognize that eight in 10 African Americans are Christian. 
8 in 10, how in the world could I have animosity for you when you are us? But I want to say to you that perhaps one of the reasons why we are here is because there was something we needed to do, something we needed to get in order to go where we needed to go. And I'm going to argue to you today, brothers and sisters, mothers and fathers, that that time is over. I have respect and admiration for ancestors like Frederick Douglass, Harriet Tubman, and Nat Turner. Christians who fought for our liberation. They are my ancestors as well as they are yours. But I must also say that I... I'm always thinking about an African proverb that says, after you use a boat to cross a river, you don't hoist it upon your back to climb a hill. It is time for us to reevaluate those things that we have been given and take a very cold, clear-eyed view of the things that we do because those people who sought to subjugate us, those people who sought to destroy us, gave it to us. That is as plain as I can make it. I want us to understand and think about how this, this image of Ast, you might know her as Isis. Who knows Isis? Let's see by show of hands. And who is calling her Ast or Aset? I want us to find out how this image of Ast suckling her son Heru became this. That's what we must study and understand. And I know that some of you are saying, that's not who I see when I pray. I get that. But I want you to understand that the institutions that you are part of want you to see this image. There's a reason. There is a reason. We're going to go further into it. Anyone know what this image is? This is Elmina Slave Dungeon sometimes called slave castle. It is certainly not a castle to the Africans who were enslaved there. And I want you to understand that as I took my third journey there with my queen, who was sitting here, Nika, Dr. Nika Daniels Osaze in Prakamaat, I must pay homage and, and give honor to the person that guides me and keeps me upright. As we went there, I was once again told about the the painful experience that our ancestors, our direct ancestors experienced in, for example, the slave dungeon where women would be packed there in a room that is about half the size of this, three to 500 women packed there for as many as three months, menstruating, using the bathroom, crying, bleeding, and eating all in the same space. In fact, recent excavations have actually shown us that about four feet of the floor, at least we thought it was the floor, was actually the refuse and the human remains and the bones and the skin and the tears of our ancestors in that space. And in fact, if you look at this courtyard here, well, you'll see this um, elevated area, that's where the enslaver would stand to look at the women as they were trotted out to decide who he would rape. And if that woman said that she would not allow herself to be defiled, they would tie her leg to a chain, a, a ball and chain, and allow her to stay in the sun until she changed her mind or perished. And then you see the wasting cell that is there the cell that they would take rebellious Africans and place in with no food and no water and allow them to die. And then when they died, they'd bring their bodies out into the courtyard and leave them for everyone to see. And just a few feet away, there's this. What is that? Church. That's the church. You have to ask yourself, if our ancestors were praying and then slayers were praying, the divine force could have only answered some of those prayers. Whose prayers did they answer? This is a painful reality, but it is the reality. You should understand that after saying that Africans had no souls and would not be uh, baptized as if we had a choice in the matter, then there were forced baptisms where we actually see beginning with Father Bartolomas de las Casas, who talks about the enslavement of Native Americans, saying that actually Africans should be enslaved because we have no souls. And this begins 
the enslavement of Africans. And then we know, I'm going through this very quickly. I have 11 minutes left. Then you know that the papal bulls, the actual documents that come from the church, actually say that we will not only allow enslavement of our ancestors, but coordinate the enslavement of our ancestors. And then eventually, those Christians decide that they should force us to be um, actual Christians. Take a look at this. It actually says, and this comes from Spanish friar Juan Marquez in his book, El Gobernado Cristiano. By the way, virtually everything I say will be cited. I may not mention the citation, but please look at the screen. He says, oh, who can be so blind as not to see the great mercies God has this bestowed upon unlearned Negroes through slavery, bringing them into the power of Christian lords who have given them light, the light of the gospel. These traditions were forced upon us. These traditions were given to us by Europeans who sought to destroy us. If you want to know more about this, this is an excellent book that I'd suggest by Catherine uh, Gerbner, uh, Christian Slavery. You need to take, to take a look at this book. One of the reasons why we disagree very often is because people are not doing their own research. And it's of critical importance for us to do that. And so when I went to Elmina, of course, I was in Ghana, right? You know that Elmina is in Ghana, right? Of course, if a great tragedy had happened to your ancestors, you would figure you would know where it took place, right? Why is it we don't know that? Well, when I was in Ghana, I saw the largest images of what I will call the Tom Hu or the white Jesus. They didn't just steal us. They remained on the continent, continent seeding division, discontent, and disunity. These are the images that I see, large images of a white Mary, a white Jesus. Look at this statue here. Gigantic. And I know that some of you are saying, yeah, that's West Africa, you know, we don't do that, right? Here's Abyssinian Baptist Church and Mother Bethel AME just a few miles from here. The Christian church has been the greatest purveyor of white supremacist thought. Someone say, ouch, if it hurts. Ouch. It's true. It's true. And I know that some will actually say, well, Jabari, we know the enslavement story. We know that the, our ancestors, who were West Africans, actually were not Christians until our enslavement. However, they will say, and I'm sure my dear brother will say this. By the way, I'm going to show you why he shouldn't. I'm warning him. But just take a look at this story here. They're going to talk about Nubia. They're going to talk about Ethiopia and say, well, these were early Christian communities. But did those communities become Christian in a bloodless, costless manner? That's the story they do not want you to know. Take a listen. Of course, the sound is enough. Yeah. Get started once Here we go. Right. What I want to say is while this is a brother that I respect and love, he, that doesn't mean that he's not above being chastised for things that he said. So I want you to hear him say properly that there are early Christian communities, but then also say something very interesting about the comedic tradition and comedic people. Listen. I mean, the Latin-speaking West in North Africa, like where Augustine and Tertullian are from, and then Egypt, which was mostly Greek-speaking. But then you got two more, and these are independent African kingdoms. And these are black kingdoms, right? Egyptians and North Africans, they weren't black. Um, they was, you know, like they are now. They're brown, right? They're light-skinned. Um, you know, and so, uh, but, but they weren't black, you know? And black folks always trying to be like, oh, they was black. Like, no, they weren't black, you know? They, they, they draw paintings on themselves. They talk about black people uh, as if they're not black, right? It's in, the, it's in the primary text. We don't have to go to say that the Egyptians was black to feel proud of, of African history. You know why? Because we got two other proud kingdoms that we can say was definitely black. And we, why don't we look at them? I don't understand why more, more of us don't say, what about Nubia? You know, that was a black ancient African kingdom, just as old as Egypt. They built more pyramids than the Egyptians did, or I should say more of them survived to the present than Egypt, Egypt did. Let's talk about Nubia or Kush. And then, of course, we got Axum, Ethiopia, another black sub-Saharan African kingdom. The, here's We're going to stop that there for the sake of time. I want you to recognize that those are the two nations that people always mention. Well, Christianity is very old. I remember when I was younger, people would hand me copies of the Kebra Nagast. This is the black Bible, they would say. 
and I knew my Rastafarian brothers would also talk about Selassie I and, and about the traditions that come out of Ethiopia and the traditions that come out of Nubia. But how did they become Christian nations? There's the part that people don't tell you. Well, you have to take the journeys and learn the story. You're seeing here an image of my queen and I journeying to Ethiopia, a magnificent place, but one with a difficult history in some instances. We can't just insert Ethiopia and insert Nubia and then correct the reality that Christianity has been damaging to our people, destructive of our nation, destructive of our history, why I'd say that we are in the midst of the greatest example of identity theft. You should know that this is how Ethiopia becomes Christian. It originally followed ancient African traditions until a man who was actually taken as captive named Bishop Fermentius, actually who was a Syro-Greek, became the tutor of the king's son. And he actually, now think about this, he's working with a child. A child. Well, I would actually say to you, think of it this way. Would you want, dear Christian brothers and sisters, for you to send someone to school, your child to school, and they return and say they're not the same spiritual tradition as you? How comfortable would you be with that? Well, that is in fact what Fermentius did. And that boy would then convert to Christianity and become the king of Ethiopia. His name is Izana. Please say Izana with me. Izana. You have to study this. Izana then goes, here are the coins, he goes and uh, prevents Ethiopians from uh, um, uh, erecting their stele, which is something they did according to their traditions, that seemed to be quite close to the Kemetic Nubian traditions, by the way. And then he does something very interesting. Our dear brother, Dr. Bantu, gives you Ethiopian Nubia, right? Well, what he's not telling you is that this, e this converted Ethiopian king then goes to Nubia and destroys its cities, kills its priests. That's how Nubia falls. This transition to Christianity was not bloodless. They didn't just say, hey, Christianity works, let's do it. Here's an image that is supposed to be, that was recently drawn of, of Taharqa. Supposed to be one of the last kings of Nubia. A, a proud African. Well, those things that he wrought were destroyed by Azana. Both Ethiopia and Nubia fell because of what took place, the work of a Greek Syrian man. That's what happens. He becomes the bishop of Ethiopia. Let's move quickly. There's no way I'm going to get through all of this. This is a beautiful image, right, of a Native American man? Right? Well, if we don't understand history correctly, this will actually seem like it makes sense. We know that groups of people move. You would never think to see Donald Trump as a Native American, but some people would like you to believe that. When Dr. Bantu says that the Egyptians aren't black, that's what he's doing. Really quickly, he's focusing on this period. This is the third and fourth century CE of the Common Era instead of focusing on the three millennia that preceded it. 3,000 years. You can't say that the Egyptians aren't black after the, after the Persians, the Assyrians, the Greeks, the Romans, and then in there someplace the Arab invasion of 637 CE and then say they're not black? If you do that, and I want to say you're doing this unintentionally, you're doing the service of our oppressors. These are the images you should see. Here is King Namur, the founder of Kemet. You can find a documentary on Kemet every day of the week, but you will never see an image of the man that put it together. His nose is wider than anyone in this room. His lips are thicker than anyone in this room. This is the man that puts Kemet together. And then it falls apart. And then this man brings it back together. And then it falls apart. And this man, and then this man. These are Africans. If you just focus on the Coptic period, that's like you saying that Donald Trump is a Cherokee. 
That's the problem we have here. And I also need for you to see this man as my time is running out. This man wrote the world's oldest complete book. His name is Patahotep. Say Patahotep with me. Patahotep. These are the Africans that are being hidden. And finally, very quickly, I want you to understand that Christianity in those regions, which was forced upon those people, then seeks to destroy the ancient African tradition. Take a look at this temple, which, is, which was named Philae. Say Philae with me. Philae. Or Pilak. Say Pilak with me. Pilak. It is here where we see Constantine do his dangerous work, saying that if you actually practice the pagan traditions, you will do so under the pain of death. This temple is then closed. And we see the last inscription in the ancient African language. And then we see something curious. Desecration of this temple. Do you see that? With a Coptic cross. And we actually see that these places were defiled. Can you see how Ast is carved out here, chiseled out? This is what those Christians, look at how they destroyed her face. Family, that is the tradition that we have been placed in. I wish I had a whole hour to talk to you about this. I do not. We'll come back on, on the rebuttal. But I want you to understand that there's a story that you ain't been told. I'm going to leave you with this image here. This is a great temple called the Temple of Luxor. Beautiful temple. Ipet Resiet. And in that temple, you'll actually see that the Christians that made it their church plastered over and painted images of themselves. And in this instance, our dear brother, Dr. Bantu, is correct. Those ain't Africans. Those are the Tamu, the Europeans that inhabited that space and defiled your ancient traditions. Time. Thank you. Now we will have um, Dr. Moheb Bantu uh, to present for his 20 minutes. And then after that, we will have a rebuttal by Brother Jabari Osaze. Um. So first of all, I want to, again, also uh, thank the King Movement, Brother Chris. I want to thank Dr. Mason, the Epiphany Fellowship, and also want to thank my dear brother, uh, Brother Jabari, and the Shrine of Maat. Everybody, it's so great to be here. I echo everything that my brother said about our desire for cordiality uh, and a, a common shared experience and a common humanity that we share, uh, and also a desire to engage uh, in civil uh, interreligious dialogue. And so uh, so uh, I'm very excited to do that. Uh, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run through a presentation and then I'll, I'll address some of the things uh, that Brother Jabari brought up, some of the excellent points that Brother Jabari uh, brought up in the rebuttal. Uh, but first, I wanna, I wanna give my answer to the first question of, is Bisrat the white man's religion? And I'm gonna explain a little bit about some of these terms that we're using, uh, but everybody say Bisrat. Bisrat. Thank you. Uh, Bisrat is an ancient Ethiopian word that means the gospel, That's, or it means good news, right? And so I will be using the word Bisrat frequently uh, in replacement of the word Christianity, uh, simply to exemplify one of the points that I'm going to make, is, which is that Bisrat has within itself the ability to translate itself into various languages and adapt its, uh, adapt its timeless universal message into different cultural milieu and symbols and context. Like manner, I'm going to be using the word Nazrawi. Everybody say Nazrawi. When I say Nazrawi, this is an ancient Ethiopian word that would translate to, technically it means Nazarenes, but in the context that it was used in ancient Ethiopia, it meant uh, what we now call Christians. And in the same way, when I say Nazrawi, I mean Christians. And when I say Bisrat, I mean Christianity. Uh, also, I want to do a little bit more definition. Uh, what do I mean when I say Bisrat, right? Uh, I mean, I'll probably weave in a little bit of rebuttals into this, into this conversation as well. Uh, because one, one central point uh, that I'll be sharing with Brother Jabari is that um, the vast majority of what he just shared, uh, which is very true, ugly history in the white man's Christianity, is not something that I am here to defend today. I do not defend that. I do not, I do not claim that. That is not my religion. That is not my belief system. Uh, the Bible that I believe is the inspired word of God says that if you see your brother or sister in need and do not have pity on them, the love of God is not in you. The Bible also says in Isaiah that those who oppress the poor, God does not hear their prayers. So what Brother Jabari showed me, what I also visited, El Mine, and what, we're, what we all are very well familiar with, a Europeanized Christianity that has and still does oppress our community is not something that I claim or am a part of, and therefore I'm not here to defend today. So we don't need to even talk about that. What I am here to defend today is uh, 
what I'm defining as bisrot based on various biblical citations. So this is the parameters I'm drawing around what I, what I understand to be the community of bisrot, the message of bisrot that our Lord Yeshua of Nazareth preached 2,000 years ago. And that is that the creator of everything, God, uh, you know, Shangdi, uh, you know, Zarathustra, whatever word your culture uses to call the one, the great creator of all things, who is perfect and who is ta- has existed from time immemorial, that creator, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, made humanity, each and every one of us, in his image. And despite humanity's rebellion against his rule and incapacity to live in complete harmony with his perfect will, makes available to all humanity salvation from eternal separation from him, only by grace through faith in the incarnation of the Messiah Jesus, fully God and fully human, who lived a perfect life, died on a cross, becoming the object of divine wrath for human sin, and rose from the dead so that all who trust in him can, by the power of the Holy Spirit, live fully as witnesses to his kingdom, which will be fully realized at his glorious return. That's what I believe. That's what I will die for. That is the belief system that governs my entire existence, and that is what I'm defending. And so, uh, just so we're clear on what Bisrod is. What do we mean by white people when we say that, that Bisrot is the white man's religion? What I'm here to argue is that what I just explained to you, which really comes from God's word, doesn't come from me, uh, that that is not the result of the white man. That is not a message. That is not a belief system that originated with the white man. But what do we mean when we say white man? Well, specifically, what I'm, I'm answering the question of what do we, as in we today, mean when we say white man when we're talking about the first century, when Bisrot first came to its fruition in the person and work of Jesus Christ? And so I'm, I'm answering the question of what do we mean, by, what do we today mean when we say white people back then? And what, I'm, what I would argue that what we mean and what I mean by that is, first of all, I mean citizens of the Roman Empire and or Europe. This is the predecessor of what would later become known as whiteness, the Western world. I also mean people who are of light or, or medium or olive skin tone can potentially be considered white depending on who they are and, and also how they stand into this third category, which is people who deeply embrace and promote Romanitas. The idea of making Rome great again. The idea of Rome, Rome is a great empire. If you buy into this particular empire, you can be a part of this, of this uh, white, to use it, imp- imputed into that context, ide- ideation. And so what I'm arguing is that according to that definition of whiteness, right, according to the ancient context of being citizens of the Roman Empire, who can, by virtue of their skin tone, identify with and participate in this identity, and people who embrace it and promote its, its imperial agenda, that identity is not where Bisrot came from at all. Uh, second point, uh, first, first uh, and I want to make that, I want to make that point uh, through four simple points. First of all, is that the doctrine of white supremacy does not come from Bisrot, right? There is an evil called white supremacy that we are still uh, languishing under even today, and not just in America, but all over the world. And it's been around for quite some time. But it did not originate with Bisrot. It did not come from the Bible, but it came from Romanitas itself. It comes from the Roman Empire. And I'll show you that. This is a mosaic from North Africa that actually shows an indigenous North African person who has a black Ethiopian slave who is helping him or being forced to serve him in his hunting. And this is from, uh, this is from the town of, of um, Hippo Regius in modern-day Algeria. But this is just an example, some primary examples of showing the early racist attitudes that Romans had towards people with dark skin, towards black people. Uh, this is from Plato. One of the founding thinkers uh, that, that really kind of undergirds Western society and whiteness. So right in the middle of everything that governs our legal, economic, social, political, uh, cultural society that is the Western world, that is whiteness, that is Europe and, and the Americas, Plato, one of, the fa- one of its founding thinkers, you see right here in his Gorgias where he says, but I believe that nature itself reveals that it is a just thing for the better man and the more capable man to have a greater share than the worse man and the less capable man. And this is just one example. I could show you a hundred more in Aristotle and Socrates, in Plato, in all these other classical authors, right? This is their belief, that they were better than everyone else and that and anybody that was lesser than them should be their servant. And one of the various types of people that they saw as less than them was black people. And we see that right here in Juvenal, who's the, or late, uh, the late antique Roman historian and, and, uh, and, and satirical writer who said, let the straight-legged man laugh at the club-footed man, the white man at the Ethiopian." 
And Ethiopian in the Greek language just means black, right? Because the modern nation that we now know as Ethiopia didn't call itself that until much, much later. It was Habeshat, and it was also centered in Aksum. And the name Ethiopia, the, the word Ethiopia is a Greek word. It's not an African word. It's not an, it's not an Ethiopian word. And it just means black. It means literally burnt-faced one. So right here we see that it was part of Roman attitudes to think that blackness was akin to being handicapped or was akin to being lesser than. And we see right here that what do we do with lesser people in the Roman Empire? We dominate them. So again, this is before Yeshua took on flesh and preached the gospel, the Bisrat. This was part of Roman society already before Bisrat even came around. And even Malcolm X was aware of this. In his autobiography, Malcolm X was aware of the fact that, that white supremacist expressions of Christianity, which I'm here today clearly to say, is not Christianity. And the Bible is clear about that. That is not Christianity. But Malcolm X was even clear about that that was not the origin of Christianity, what later become, became this oppressive expression of it. In his autobiography, he says, you can go right back to the very beginning of Christianity. Catholicism, the genesis of Christianity, as we know it to be presently constituted with its hierarchy, was conceived in Africa by those whom the Christian church calls the Desert Fathers. The Christian church returned to Africa under the banner of the cross, conquering, killing, exploiting, pillaging, raping, bullying, beating, and teaching white supremacy. And so, again... Those folks that came back and built Elmina and Cape Coast and the dozens of slave castles in the name of Christianity were not Christians. I'm just coming out and just going to say that. These were not Christians. These were not followers of Yeshua of Nazareth, right? But even Malcolm X understood that there was a distinction between that and that which had developed for a thousand years leading up to Cape Coast and what was originated primarily in Africa with African theologians. So the second point I want to make is uh, that Bisrat actually emerged among a marginalized people group of color. brown skin, Aramaic-speaking, Palestinian Jews were the first people God himself took on flesh in the person of Jesus Christ, and he preached his bisrot to a bunch of other brown skin, Aramaic-speaking people who themselves were colonized by the Roman Empire, who were in the midst of wars with the Roman Empire, and they fought against them. This is a, 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 a a, uh, uh, the, the part of Titus's arch where it shows how the Roman emperor Titus conquered Israel and Palestine and carried off much of their sacred uh, objects back to Rome. And this is a quote from Cicero, again, a foundational Roman thinker who also displays Roman negative racist attitudes towards Jewish people and Middle Eastern people, which was one of their colonized uh, regions. He says, then too, there are those unhappy revenue farmers and what misery to me were the miseries of those to whom I owed so much had handed them over as slaves to Jews and Syrians, themselves peoples born to be slaves. So Bisrat emerged within a racist, anti-black, ethnocentric Roman Empire, but it emerged in a, among a colonized, brown-skinned, Aramaic-speaking people who themselves were colonized by that same Roman Empire. Third point I want to make is that as, as a Nasrawi, somebody again please say Nasrawi, as a Nasrawi myself, um, I, 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 believe in, I believe in the Bisrat. I'm a follower of Yeshua. And part of what we believe as Nasrawi is that there is a difference between what we call these days contextualization and syncretism or extractionism. What I mean by extractionism is the idea that your religious beliefs is at odds with your cultural identity. This is, uh, this is how... This is how Christianity was introduced to so many black and brown people around the world. That our version of Christianity is the only right one, white folks saying that, and your culture is antithetical to this religion. And therefore, if you want to be a part of our religion, you have to start looking, acting, talking like us, right? Which again is not true bisrot. But that is what we call extractionism. Then you, on the other hand, you have syncretism. The idea that your religious uh, beliefs are completely harmonious with your cultural or ancestral beliefs and that there is no difference and you can do both of them fully. But as Nasrawi, we believe that what the Bible teaches us is to avoid either one of those extremes because the Bible tells us that God's image is on each and every one of us and God is working and speaking even in the religious practices of people before they come to fully know him in the person of Jesus Christ by grace through faith. So there are elements in every culture and every religion that harmonize with the truth and with God's truth as communicated in the Bible. And when and where that happens, we embrace those things. And we use them to communicate the bisrot, where they are harmonious, where they are in contradiction, we reject them. The Holy Spirit and the bisrot calls us out of our people 
And yet at the same time, it makes us better versions of our people. And we can use our very culture and our, and our symbols and our traditions to amplify the bisra. That's what we call contextualization. And the Bible itself implores us to do that. That was a very, that was a, a crucial part of God's salvation plan to be made to fruition in Jesus Christ from the very beginning when he called Abraham to be the father of a great nation. But he said, through you, all nations will be blessed. And so if there were ever, if there was ever a people group that we were going to say uh, Bisrat it belongs to them, it would have been the Jewish people because all the first uh, Nazrawi in the New Testament were, were Jewish from Palestine. And yet the, the New Testament itself takes great pains to communicate to the Jew, Jewish people, this ain't just for y'all. My salvation plan was not just for y'all. And I'm, that's not a new thing. I've been telling y'all that since Abraham. I've been telling y'all that since Isaiah told you that it's too small a thing for you to be my servant. In fact, I will call you to be a light to the nations. My salvation plan will reach to the ends of the earth. And it's for all people, right? And so we see that come to fruition in the New Testament. But especially in Acts 10, Peter gets a vision from, uh, from the Holy Spirit saying, kill and eat. And he says, I won't touch anything that's unclean. And God tells Peter, don't call anything unclean what I've called clean. And this is, again, what white supremacist Christianity has failed to understand, right? That, and so right there we see that it is not just for Jewish people. But, again, you know, Nasrawi and Bisra, these things are much more kind of closer in practice and in ideology. You talk about the Passover and communion and all of these different traditions that are in Bisra, they're much more connected to Judaism. So, again, if anybody was ever going to think, oh, this religion is only for these people, which was a very normal way to think in the ancient world, that this religion is for this country or this tribe or this city and everybody has their local deities and their local religions. But so it would have been a natural thing to think that, oh, this new thing called Bisra or called the Evangelion or called the Way, that's for Jewish people. And the New Testament itself says, no. This is for everybody. And not only is it for everybody, Acts 10, but Acts 15 at the Council of Jerusalem, there was a question of, well, if non-Jewish people are going to be part of this, do they have to be circumcised? I.e., do they have to be like us? Do they have to act Jewish? Do they have to act like the brown-skinned, Aramaic, colonized people who were the first Nazrawi? And the answer was no. It says it seems good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to place further burdens upon you. And so you can become a Nazrawi as you are. Because it's not about your practices, it's not about your traditions, it's not about your clothes. It's about putting faith in the risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's what makes you a Nazrawi, right? It's not about particular traditions. So not only are all people accepted, but they can be as they are. And again, the Bible itself implores us to contextualize. The, the, the Hebrew names for God, Elohim, Yahweh, these are not originally Hebrew names. These actually came from Canaanite deities, that Moses, and Je like, he was introduced to through Midianite, his father-in-law, Jethro. So even the Old Testament takes the sacred names from other cultures, pagan cultures, and say, that person that you Canaanites call uh, El or Yah, that's actually the name that we're, that's the name of the God who created everything. And that's the name we're going to use. In the New Testament, John calls Yeshua the Logos. Again, a platonic term that had no, one, that no, no resonance for the Jewish people that were mainly the majority of the Nazrawi. But he says that thing that Plato and other folks that you guys, the Hellenes, call the Logos, that's who Jesus is. That's who Yeshua is. Using your cultural symbols to interpret the same timeless universal bisra. And that is, how, that, is, that is how Christianity is meant to spread. Last point I'm going to make is that bisra first entered Africa and Asia freely and developed without and often in spite of Roman and European involvement. From the very beginning in Acts 2, it showed that, that God in his providence chose a people group, the Hebrews, who themselves were of every color and every hue and were scattered through the diaspora, in, in, as the word says, in every nation under earth. Persians, Arabs, uh, Libyans, Egyptians, Romans, Cappadocians, all people were gathered at Pentecost. And when the Holy Spirit fell and were sent out from there, the message of Bisrat continued to spread throughout the entire known world. And, and, and Bisrat grew um, with Jewish communities originally in these different places. But then the message went out into their non-Jewish neighbors into these various empires. And again, this was when it was free of colonialism. This is at a time when the Roman Empire was killing Christians. How would we say that Christianity came from the Roman Empire when they were massacring their own citizens who believed in this thing? Were throwing them in coliseums to the lions because they didn't want to pray to Jupiter and Pluto and, and, and all of these other Greek and Roman and Latin gods that everybody was being forced to pray to. This was in the Roman Empire. This is what we now call Europe. Now, on the flip, 
from the very beginning, in the first few centuries, Christianity was also in Persia, in the Persian Empire. And the interesting thing is that at that time, Christianity, the Bisrat, was actually more dangerous and volatile in what we now call Europe. That was where, that was where Nasrawa were being Christian, were being killed, left and right. But in the Persian Empire, the Nasrawi, or as they were called in Persia, uh, Nasraye in Syriac, who spoke Persian and Syriac as well, this is what we now call Iraq, Iran, and Afghanistan. The Bisrat was growing freely in this particular context. And in fact, it was actually safer to be a Nasrawi in Iraq and Iran and Afghanistan than it was in what we now call Italy, Greece, and Spain. That was where it was dangerous to be a Nasrawi. In the Roman Empire, that was where they were against the Bisrat. Persian Empire was like, yeah, it's fine, it's cool, you know, we're, we're Zoroastrian and there's Hindus and Buddhists here, so you got, yeah, you, you Nasrawi, you can do your thing too. And, it was, and in fact, there were even people who left the Roman Empire and went into the Persian Empire and they were actually called Christians. But the indigenous Persian Nasrawi, who themselves were much closer actually to the Semitic Aramaic speaking language and culture of Yeshua, they weren't even called Christians. They didn't even know what a Christian was until Roman people showed up and said, hi, we're, we're Christiane, we're Christians. And the indigenous Persians were like, well, we're Nazarenes. I don't know what a Christian is. Let's talk about it. Oh, we believe in the Bisrat. Okay, yeah, we're the same. I mean, we're different. But again, that, that in and of itself proves that, that Bisrat came into the entire world, the known world at that time, before it became, before it became co-opted or attempted to be co-opted by the Roman Empire in the 4th century. It, and then from the Persian Empire, it spread into different areas. Armenia is actually the first Christian nation. King Tiridates III was, heard the gospel, the Bisrat, from an indigenous Armenian named Gregor the Illuminator and actually embraced Bisrat as the national religion of Armenia in the year 301, over 10 years before Constantine ever thought about becoming a Christian, which he wasn't, by the way. But um, Armenia, first Christian nation. Also, Persian uh, Nasrawi also spread into India, and you had expressions of Christianity like this cross with a dove on it sitting on top of a lotus flower, a very example of that contextualization I was talking about because lotus flowers in Buddhism symbolize new life, and also it's on the three levels of the universe, but it has the cross on top showing the supremacy of Christ. You have a Chinese sailor that talks about Christianity coming into China in the 600s, and it was actually known as the Persian religion in China. And it, it, it talks about uh, Christianity. It calls it the Jing Zhao. Somebody say Jing Zhao. Again, they didn't know what, they didn't know what Christianity was. They, they followed the luminous way, the Jing Zhao. And, so this, and then you see here an Egyptian Ankh represent, in, a, in a Christian Coptic monastery representing the, the, the true life through the cross. And so, again, this is just some examples to show that Bisrat was global from the very beginning. And it came into all these places not only without European involvement, but also sometimes in spite of European oppression, who were trying to stamp out the Bisrat. Thank you. I want to thank our dear brother for his spirited rejoinder. Um, it, it's, it's good when you're able to debate someone who has done some work. And so that's why there was no way that I would have missed this because I, I will tell you that the scholarship of the brother on the other side is something that I respect. It makes this so much more interesting to be able to have some conversations with someone who has studied something. Now, let me say this to you. Having said that, how dare you use introduced and the message spread as euphemisms for the destruction of world African civilization? You can't just use those words and make it sound like it happened in a bloodless manner. Notice that our dear brother did not respond to the destruction of these temples, to the fact that Izana goes into a very nation that he's crediting as a great nation and destroys it in order to make it Christian. He needs to answer this. That's the way that white people talk about it. The message spread. No, you killed some black folk. You defiled their temples. That's what you did. I will not allow euphemisms to right away the destruction of my ancestors and his. We can't do that. And let's go further. When we say the message spread, we're going to talk about this more in the next round. I might even give you a peek of it in this round. When we say the message spread, and that there's contextualization. 
let's understand that for the most part, all of those members of this tradition are using the same book. The book that has the same laws. The book that has the same cultural norms and mores. The book that has written out your African woman who relegates her as a second-class human. I'm going to show it to you. I know some of you are like, that can't be. Listen, when I have this conversation with my own mother, who I love dearly, she says, oh, we don't read those parts. <laughs> and I know many of you probably don't either. And you know why you don't? Because you're good people. I'm not questioning who you are, but I am questioning what you do. So that is why we have to talk very clearly about these issues. Once more, I'm going to show it again and hope that our dear brother responds to it. I want you to see the desecration of the temples. You can't simply say that the message spread. How does it spread? Does this mean that people who you purport to pray to People who you purport to love, people who you purport to honor, are either killed, defiled, or uh, made less than, than human, less than relevant. Just think of it for a second here. If you say that they willingly gave in to Christianity, you're saying something else. You are saying that their indigenous African traditions, traditions that they practiced, traditions that they held dear, Traditions that were copied, that's in the next round. Traditions that were copied weren't good enough for them. They had their own traditions. They didn't just say, I'm not doing nothing. Maybe I'm going to just wear a cross. It didn't work that way. They were forced. If you defile a temple that has been in existence for 3,000 years, you are doing isfet, sin. Even if you don't practice the tradition. If someone came up in here and turned this to a comedic shrine, and you know that this is your comedic brother talking to you, not someone distant who sees you as inhum inhuman that would like to subjugate you, you would raise hell on Sunday if you came back. And I said, well, we did something with Pastor Mason. He's not here anymore. The message spread. We can't use those euphemisms for the destruction of African civilization. And as long as we do, we are doing dishonor to our ancestors. Do you not see the Coptic cross carved into the temple of Philae? Explain it. Why is it that these things are carved after a Roman emperor says that no one can practice these traditions anymore? Why does that happen? And let's be clear, the Ethiopian church, this is something I didn't tell you before. Remember we talked about our friend Fermentius? The Syro, um, the Greek that actually brings Christianity to Ethiopia. Well, how does he do that? He actually calls to the Coptic church in Egypt, the folks doing this to your sacred spaces, to send reinforcements. It's Europe. You can call it Bisrat, whatever you want. This is, this, is, this is Rome doing this. You know very well that when people want to destroy you, they don't send in themselves. They send those people that look like you. That's what happened. So let's follow. Rome to Egypt, Egypt to Ethiopia, Ethiopia to Nubia. That's how this happens. Rome is still in control. It's easier to control the people when you have their souls. This is the very reason why we see these Roman emperors decide, by the way, he also does something that I think is, is, is intellectually and uh, scholarly, it, it's classically sloppy. He says, well, why would the Roman church kill Christians and then project Christianity. Well, what he's done once again is he's showing you the image of Donald Trump as a Cherokee. You have to understand that it is true that the Roman Empire 
actually sacrificed Christians. That's a fact. It wasn't as many as we often hear, because I think now that we've done some analysis, that might have been magnified. But nonetheless, people were killed. And some of those people were Africans. But guess what he did then? He said, you know what? This, em this empire is far flung, and everyone has different traditions and doing different things. What's the best way for me to remain in control? He co-ops Christianity. Before that, Christianity was a small thing. It is Constantine and Theodosian. I hope you're going to talk about the Theodosian decree. If not, if you don't, I will. Just understand that those emperors are the ones that spread this tradition. And sometimes they do it with black gloves on. Yeah, that's what I call the sellouts, the black gloves. But it's still Rome. If you say it spreads to India, it spreads to these places, what are you saying that the people, the traditions that those peoples followed were less than Christianity? That is what you're saying. They were less than Christianity. If you're driving a Toyota and I pull up in a Benz and you take the Benz, you have said that the Benz is better than a Toyota, right? Let's make it plain. Well, if you say that the tradition spreads and people take it, you are saying, in fact, that those people did not value their traditions. That is not true. And this is why these, this defilement takes place. Look at them carve out the image of Ost and then steal her for their own. This is a vile act that occurred. Look, I've, this is a little dark here. Can you see how they actually chiseled out her face as she suckles Heru? The Christians did this. Those Christians who were actually created by Rome, who then create the Ethiopian Christian uh, uh, um, reality that doubles back to destroy Nubia. Rome couldn't destroy Nubia on its own. That's a long story that I don't have time to tell you. So they sent in reinforcements. They used black gloves. He has to talk about the defilement. If he doesn't, you're allowing him to talk about the, the murder of your ancestors and just sneeze at it. I won't let him do that, and I hope you won't either. Christian or Kemetic, Hebrew or Baptist, I don't care what you call yourself. If you're an African, you should be upset about this. I'm calling your African card. Is it okay for our ancestors to be defiled and destroyed? Is it okay for their traditions to be stolen? He has to answer this. Thank you. All right, all right. Thank you, Brother Jabari. I'm loving this conversation. Um, uh, thank you, brother. Um, I, I think I did answer it, actually, even uh, in a more powerful way than you have, because in, I'm in agreement with you, actually, that what has happened to our ancestors uh, in the name of a false Christianity, I not only denounced it earlier, but I even actually invoked the name of God against it. I'm saying that, actually, not only is it just wrong on a moral ground, it is wrong from divine perspective, that what happened and what is happening to our ancestors in the false name of Christianity is sin in the eyes of God. And so it is evil and wrong. Um, so uh, in agreement with you there, and I think I actually even said it stronger. Um, so uh, a few points uh, just, you know, to go back and address uh, some of the points that you brought up, which are great. Um, I, I have to uh, disagree with you, and I would like to point you actually to some very important uh, is Aksumite contemporary evidence and sources uh, which is another thing I would actually challenge you to bring some sources for a lot of the things that you're saying, uh, because they, I didn't hear any, and it was, it was they were wholly lacking. Um, and so uh, again, when when you talk about uh, you know when you talk about fermentius, uh, you know, and you and you intimate that there's an inappropriate relationship going on there, and you're assuming that fermentius tutored is King Izana, who was the uh, Aksumite king of Ethiopia, or Aksum as it was called in the fourth century. Uh, when you're insinuating that there's inappropriate things there, again, no sources. And also, uh, when you are repeating a false narrative that this was actually a child raising a king, uh, or this was a slave raising a child king, 
actually, again, the thing I want to point you to is literally an article by Gedichu Haile, who himself is an Ethiopian, an Ethiopian scholar, and he has a journal in Analecta Bolian, Bolandiana, where, and the article is called A Homily Attributed to St. Fermentius. And in this article, he actually notes that, the, that actually the, the common narrative that you've just regurgitated for us, that Fermentius, who was a Syrian, not a Greek, but he was from Tyre, that's not in Greece, uh, but that's what we now call Lebanon, so who was a Syrian uh, bishop who was himself a slave. So notice the reversal actually there that, that Bisrat actually comes into each Ethiopia by a slave. We talk about Christianity coming to us as slaves, but actually uh, Christianity entered into Axum by a Syrian slave who is himself a slave in the imperial court. But in Gedichu Haile's article, he actually translates a homily that's written in Ge'iz that has an anonymous author, but it's attributed to Fermentius. And in it, it actually demonstrates evidence that Izana was not a, a child when he was being uh, discipled and, and the, the bisrot was shared with him by Fermentius. But actually, he was already an adult. And so that, that's a piece of evidence that you might want to look at that would clarify that. So this is an adult African king, Izana, who hears the gospel, who hears the bisrot from Frumentius, a Syrian missionary who is a slave in his court, and he freely chooses to embrace Bisrat. That's another point that we have to be sure not to muddle. Now, to your point, it is, it is absolutely true that Egyptian Nasrawi Christians act, uh, acted violently towards traditional religious practitioners in Egypt who practice comedic religion. That is absolutely true. It's also true that that happened in the reverse, that Egyptian traditional practitioners of religion, and I'm going to show you this in the next uh, section, also acted violently towards Nasrawi. So from the time of the beginning of the Bisrat in Kemet, in Egypt, or Kami in Coptic, uh, then there was inter-religious violence going both ways. There were Nasrawi killing and, and, and desecrating temples that I'm going to actually show you. I'll be up front and show you some evidence of. And I'm also going to show you some evidence of that happening in the opposite. So this, there was interreligious violence going on. And by the way, that wasn't new because ancient Egypt and Kush and Persia and Arabia all went to war with each other and killed each other. So violence is not something that is unique to, uh, to Bisrat and even to kingdoms that claim to be uh, Nasrawi. But... The point is, uh, the other thing I want to clarify, again, is that you, made a, you, you also made another error when you said that Izana uh, destroyed an ancient African kingdom. He did not destroy it, actually. If you read the, the two stela uh, in Ge'iz that are attributed to him that, are, that were found in Axum, that are both in the 4th century, it actually says that he conquered them. He went to war with them, and he conquered them. But even in the Ge'iz text itself, which I would encourage you to read, it actually says that then he then allowed them to remain and live in their own lands. So he did not destroy a kingdom by any means. And, and you, got, you got to read that, Sally. It's not, it's not for me. But we can, I, can, I can send you that link after we're done. Um, now, the other thing, though, is that, and this is not an endorsement of, of Nasrawi violence by any means. right? I would, I would condemn Ezana or any king using Bisrat to do violence against someone else. right? But the thing is, is that the point that we're, the question that we were asked today is, is Bisrat a white man's religion? And the claims that have been made is that Christianity came to black people through colonialism and slavery. And that's, and, and the very fact, regardless of the fact that I denounced what Izana did, going to war against people, and then allowing them to live in their own lands, but even though I denounced that, it doesn't change the fact that he himself, an Axumite African king, freely chose to embrace Bisrat. And not only him, but all of the different, again, all of the evidence that comes out of Axum and of Egypt at that time is Christian in nature. These are people who are choosing to do this. And so this is not something that came from the Roman Empire. So that point discounts the claim that it came from the Roman Empire. Axum was an independent nation, and they had a slave from Syria that they heard the Bisrat from, and then he chose to embrace it. What he did after that, engaging in warfare, which is wrong, does not change the fact that he himself freely chose to embrace this, and he, it was not from the Roman Empire. Second point that, uh, that, that also was missed is that, uh, and, and also a flat-out incorrect thing uh, that was said, but, but, but definitely uh, uh, mingled with some truth. Um, you, you made the claim that uh, when Frumentius went back up to Egypt, that he made a connection with Athanasius, who was the bishop uh, of the uh, Egyptian church at that time, 
and then he went back and he was ordained as the first bishop. Yes, very true. And very true also that there was an alliance between Ethiopia and Egypt at the beginning of, of, of the bisrot in Ethiopia, in Axum. That is true. What you said that was not true, though, is that because there was an alliance between Axum and Egypt, that that then therefore is an indicator of, of a connection to Rome. And it is actually the exact opposite because, but I don't, I don't know if you're aware of this, but the thing about it is that, and I agree with you also when you said Constantine tried to appropriate uh, the bisrot and turn it into an agent of Roman supremacy. I agree with you. Uh, and that's why I denounce it and say that's a corruption and not the true teachings of Yeshua. But the other thing that happened after, and actually the sources that, that indicate this, are Rufinus's church history, Athanasius' own letter, uh, Apologia ad Constantinum, where Athanasius himself, and then also the two stela that are written in Gittes that are from the 4th century. So these are four primary sources I just indicated to you that you can corroborate what I'm saying. That what happened actually after Frumentius went back to Egypt and uh, what was going on in the Roman Empire actually was that the Roman Empire was under heretical leadership. There was a group called Arians that believed that Jesus was not God, but that he was a created being. This was a belief system that was rejected by Nasrawi all over the world, not just in the Roman Empire, not just because the Nicene Creed told them to. Another thing, brother, that you did not uh, speak to was what I pointed out is that there was Christianity in Persia, and then from Persia it spread into India, into China, freely and completely without any influence from the Roman Empire. So again, that point right there, and I just showed you some, well, it's still there. I showed you some evidence of Christianities, of Bisrat, that grew in China, India, Persia. They didn't even know what the Nicene Creed was. They didn't even know who, they didn't know anything about uh, all of the stuff that was going on in Rome. This came in freely. Now, the point you did make about that is that, again, Bisrat coming into these contexts and people uh, walking away from their ancestral religion and joining, uh, becoming a Nasrawi is an indicator of devaluing who they are and their identity. Again, you're missing uh, something I said in my introduction, which is that the Bisrat itself encourages and teaches us to both value our ancestry, value our culture, and also reject it at the same time. There's broken things in all of our cultures. There's sin in the black church. There's sin in the Kemetic movement. There's sin in Hebrew-Israelite movement. There's sin in the Catholic. There is no group, religion, people group in this planet that is immune to misogyny, homophobia, violence, warfare. All of us are prone to these things, right? And so what happened, as I'm showing you, they're embracing Buddhist imagery. They're embracing Hindu imagery in various places. They're embracing Egyptian imagery. So they're not totally walking away from their culture. And on top of that, the Roman Empire persecuted them for doing that because they said, you're not like us. You're not a white Roman Christian. You can't do that. And they said, guess what? We don't care. We're going to do it anyway. And during this time when Athanasius ordained Frumentius, Roman Empire was under Arian leadership. Constantius, the son of Constantine, even Constantine himself, embraced the Arian heresy. And guess what? They sent Athanasius into exile. He was living in exile in Egypt, kicked out of his own seat. Is that a picture of an Egyptian people who are in league with Rome? They have tension. And what happened at the introduction of Christianity to Ethiopia? Egyptians who were being marginalized by the Roman Empire because they were standing up for orthodoxy, saying Jesus is God, rejecting the white man's heresy that Jesus is a created, created being. Frumentius and Athanasius and Axum created an African alliance where they embraced their own orthodox theology and rejected Roman theology all at the same time.